ओ भगवत श्री वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Continuing with glorification of the all glorious ever glorious supreme personality of Godhead known as Vishnu or more fondly referred to by followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Krishna and this last name Aprameyatma this uh appears previously as almost the same name Apra- aprameya so some slight differences there the uh suffix atma or the well could be the no that's actually the noun and aprameya is the adjective so that underlines that he is a person generally the impersonalists they like to take terms like aprameya immeasurable and take this as evidence that the supreme is impersonal they take the fact that krishna is a person to claim that he is not the ultimate supreme because a person is in one place his his body has a certain height weight uh, certain features but unlimited should be mean of unlimited height uh of not any specific features this is according to the impersonal understanding because if he has one kind of feature then he doesn't have another kind of feature if he has a long nose then he doesn't have a short nose for instance if he is a bluish complexion then he is not a reddish complexion and so on and that is in one place means that he's not everywhere this is the uh less intelligent proposition of the impersonalists who do not understand that although krishna is a person he is this supreme unlimited absolute reality mm he's simultaneously everywhere and localized that that means unlimited not just to be everywhere if you say he's not localized then he's not unlimited if we think that unlimited means to be only without specific qualities then that's a limitation on and that then he's not unlimited so krishna transcends the weak reasoning of the impersonalists mm the name 250 is vishishta he transcends all in his glory he is eminent excellent so this is one of those names which uh it is a very general term includes it, it, all his qualities are included in this some names point to one quality for instance shama means that he it refers to his complexion or shangada shangadhar means he uh, holds a bow by the name of shanga so that's a particular quality but other names such as vishishta 
the name which is given today, or just now, or sadhu, or uttama. These names, they refer to all his qualities. So everything about him is excellent, of the, of the best possible quality and more. The best possible, well, that's within the realm of our thought. <laughs> but Krishna is beyond the realm of our thought. Ulangita Trividha Sima. He's beyond the realm of our thinking, our measuring, uh, our specifying. Uh, not that he's without specifics, but th- the specifics of his qualities are uh, such that we can only indicate them by language. We can't precisely describe them. So, uh, he's superior in all ways. Uh, his his whatever qualities we see in him, his mercy far exceeds the mercy of any mundane mercy. His beauty far exceeds any mundane beauty. His happiness far exceeds any thing conceived of as happiness within this world. He excels in everything, whatever he does. He's simply the best. He transcends everything. Uh, whatever, yeah. So, he, he's beautiful, but he's beautiful to such a degree that his beauty is completely in a different dimension to that of us human beings. So, generally when we think of a superior being, we think in terms of uh, how they can, they're very intelligent and very powerful and can dominate us and do dominate others. But uh, the devotees, they recognize that these qualities are there in Krishna, of course. Uh, Krishna is the most powerful, Krishna the most opulent, but his qualities, his excellent qualities, uh, such as kindness, mercy, gratefulness. These are the qualities uh, that bind the devotees to him with love. There are some religious systems in this world that largely focus on the power of God and that we should be afraid of him, we should fear him because he's so powerful that if we don't fear him, he'll smash us. I will smite him ad infinitum. So we learned in school, God speaking. But his actual quality is not to smite others, but to uplift others. To pure, Of course, he does smite him also. You know what smite means? It's, it means something like smash. But his, uh, the, the quality by, by which devotees are attracted to him are his, his purity, his genuine love and concern for all living beings. So this attracts, this, this makes him Krishna. Hmm. <coughs> Vishishta is also the name of the philosophy of Sri Ramanuja Acharya. Vishishta Advaita. That means that Advaita means everything is in one sense, one with God, but at the same time, it's a qualified oneness. It's not an absolute oneness. Shankara's philosophy is Kevala Advaita, only oneness. 
no possibility of anything else. But Ramanuja's philosophy is one of oneness. Yes, uh, everything is one with God in the sense that nothing is separate from him. But at the same time, it's a qualified oneness because we're not uh, nothing, but he is supreme. And so everything else is one with him in an inferior role or in the role of a part to the whole. Sharia Shariri Bhav, which was strongly criticized later by Madhvacharya. Anyway, uh, name 251 is Shishtakrit. So we have the names Vishishta, Vish, uh, Vishishta Shishtakrit. So, uh, although the two names Vishishta and Shishtakrit they're not very closely related, but there's some alliteration is there. The, the shisht, shishta, this, uh, what would you call that? Fin, um, it's not, well, it's, uh, two vowels and two consonants. Shishta. Vishishta, Shishta Krit. So, Shishta means uh, cultured, wise, learned, eminent, disciplined. Uh, in, in Vedic culture, there's uh, this term Shishta often comes up to uh, to refer to persons who are exemplars, often elderly people, not always elderly. And uh, there's also the term shishtacha, which means the behavior of eminent people. So that is given as an example of the behavior that we should try to also follow. That... Uh, that in tradition, we see how do the learned, the wise, the self-disciplined, how do such people behave? And then by seeing that, we should model our behavior on theirs. That is called Shishtacha Arjuna. He asked such a, well, several times he asked such questions. To Krishna in the first, about the behavior, especially in the second chapter, about the behavior of the shishtas, sthita pragyasya ka bhasha samadhi stasya keshava sthita dhi king prabhasheta kim asita vrajeta kim. Arjuna asked Krishna, how does a person who is fixed in transcendental consciousness talk? How does he walk? How does he sit? How does he converse? So it's understood that people of uh, elevated consciousness, they don't behave in the same way as ordinary people. So how to uh, come to that platform? That is by Krishna's mercy. He makes, Shishtakrit means, he makes Shishtas or one, one who has made shishtas, one who has made eminent people. Now this is important considering that the next few names are coming up after the next one. They're all concerned, several names concerned with siddhi or perfection. So it's Krishna who gives that. That's one of Krishna's names here, siddhida. So it's Krishna who makes one great. Someone who wants to be great, that is in itself an illicit desire. Those who are actually great, they don't try to be great. In the material sense, someone may try to be great by becoming a leader in any field, especially the political field, 
or in any line as a sports person, they practice to become the best. But first, anyway, though such people, they also need Krishna's mercy to become great in their line. But that is not greatness at all. Real greatness is to understand, or real greatness begins with the understanding that all these achievements that people in this world think are great, they're all meaningless. So when one desists from such meaningless pursuits, then simply by that very fact of detachment from that which everyone else in this world is either striving for or glorifies, simply by that detachment, one becomes great. So, uh, yeah, shishta means here, uh, wisdom. It, when I was speaking on uh, wisdom, proper behavior, eminent, respected, all these terms. Respected for being wise, self-controlled, this kind of respect. Different kinds of people are respected for different uh, reasons. But those who are respected by persons who are cultured because they themselves are ex- because those persons who are respected are exemplars of culture and learning and proper behavior. Uh, they are shishta. And Krishna, uh, he makes, he, he gives that quality by which even in this world, which is a world of forgetfulness of Krishna, a world of kam, krod, lob, moha, madha, matsarya, of lust, greed, Anger, illusion, pride and envy, even in this world, by Krishna's mercy, one become, can become free from all such lower tendencies and actually become uh, a great person by becoming free from those tendencies and becoming fixed in Krishna consciousness. Stitadhiv means fixed intelligence. So, uh, shishta also means uh, discipline or it means command. So, in this sense, Krishna, he gives commands via the shastra. So, shishtakrit, in this sense, means shastrakrit, one who makes the shastra. Shastra also gives the sense, the very word gives the sense of discipline. Yeah, I just recently spoke on Sadhu, the name Sadhu. So I spoke there about how Krishna is himself saintly and he makes others saintly, but that description would maybe better appear here because he makes his, he makes his devotees shishta. He makes his devotees eminent, respected, for their saintly qualities, even though devotees, they don't desire to be respected. But Krishna, he makes them respected. Even though they they don't desire that and they try to avoid that. But it is <coughs> proper that Krishna's devotees be respected for their qualities so that others can begin to understand the greatness of such devotees and that we should follow such devotees and also try to uh, develop such qualities in Krishna consciousness. Mm. So, uh, yeah, by Krishna gives Shastra, he uh, helps people's faith to become strong in that. Those who are saintly. In, in Gita, Krishna said, he speaks of the, uh, those who worship various demigods. Yepi anya devata bhakta yajante shadayan vita tepi mame. No, that's not the verse. Tepi mame vakonta yajante vidi purvakam. Those who worship different demigods, 
they do so, they, in one sense they worship Krishna, but they do so in a wrong way, not according to the rules of Shastra. So, yo, yo, yang, yang, tanung bhakta shraddha achitam itchati. Tasya tasya chalang shraddham tadeva vidhatamiyaham. Krishna says that whatever, uh, yo, yo, yang, yang, tanung bhakta, uh, whatever one becomes devoted to, Krishna says, I award such persons unshakable faith in that in in which one is devoted to. So if Krishna gives faith even to the non devotees to believe in all kinds of things, to believe in demigods, to believe in nationalism, to believe in humanism and all these different uh inauspicious combination or, or, or manifestations of ignorance, then surely Krishna will give faith to the devotee if he's sincere to uh he will Krishna will give faith in Shastra and by uh following the principles of Shastra the devotees they become the most elevated of uh Peaceful persons. Peaceful because Krishna Bhakti Nishkam Ataiv Shanta Bhakti Mukti Siddhi Kami Shakali Ashanta. Devotees are peaceful because they have no personal desires. Uh, they, whereas the non devotees, the materialists, the gross materialists, the, those who are seeking for liberation, those who are seeking for yogic siddhis, they cannot be peaceful because they have unfulfilled desires. Whereas the devotees are always fully satisfied in Krishna's service. Mm. Mm. Yamuna Acharya prays to Krishna that when I, when will I be known as your own personal servant? Uh, always uh, engaged incessantly in your service. Fully satisfied and peaceful with all material desires left far behind. All the, uh, Jumping up and down of the mind, the, the, uh, what do we call it? The vagaries of the mind, long left far behind. Uh, then he, he prays that I will be just like a person who had no master. Now I have a master, so I'm very fixed and happy in that service. Mm. So one becomes peaceful and elevated by serving Krishna. And Krishna, he makes his devotees elevated. He, he shows that his devotees are the best of all. And he did that. There, there are so many cases. Partly the whole of the Bhagavatam shows that. How uh, Ambarish Maharaj, Krishna demonstrated to Durvasa Muni, who was... Possibly the greatest yogi, the most powerful yogi, the most respected yogi, but Krishna actually humiliated him in order to show the greatness of his devotee in comparison to this yogi who was celibate, a brahmana, highly uh, accomplished, in yoga practice, but Ambarish Maharaj was a grihasta. He had not performed any yoga practice, although he was observing fasting. Uh, he was a kshatriya, so he had no apparent qualities or qualifications in comparison to Durvasa. But Krishna practically humiliated Durvasa to demonstrate to Durvasa and to the world the greatness 
of his devotees. So Krishna elevates his devotees. Similarly, Prahlad Maharaj Hiranyakashipu was so great, but he became humiliated by the little boy Prahlad. Because Prahlad, without doing any austerities like Hiranyakashipu had done, quite nonchalantly just... Uh, didn't care at all for Hiranyakashipu's power. Even the great demigods in heaven were very afraid of Hiranyakashipu's power. But Prahlad, he didn't care at all. <laughs> so Krishna elevated Prahlad and destroyed uh, Hiranyakashipu. The Pandavas, they appeared to be completely down and out, completely finished. They had, they, uh, had been, their throne had been usurped and their position and their power and glory had been usurped by Duryodhana and company. But Krishna made the, ultimately made the Pandavas glorious. So that's what, one of the things that Krishna does. He himself is so glorious, but he likes to make his devotees glorious. One time many years ago, I was speaking to a group of lawyers and after the, uh, this was in India, and after I'd given a little speech, one of them said that, well, you're saying Vishnu is supreme, but we see that Hanuman, he jumped to Lanka, but Rama, he had to build a bridge. So isn't Hanuman greater than Rama? So I replied that he jumped, that is the mercy of Rama. He gave the ability to Hanuman to jump and he presented himself as if less capable because he likes to give credit He likes to his devotees. He likes to glorify his devotees. He did it. Rama, he, he doesn't need to do and He didn't, doesn't need to do anything. But whatever he does, he does for enjoyment of his own pastimes and for glorification of his devotees. So Krishna elevates his devotees. He protects through the laws. He gives the Shastra, which are protection. They're, they're restrictions, yes, but they're restrictions that lead to protection. They're not restrictions to uh, to uh, keep us down, but they're restrictions that elevate us. The Shastra restricts us from sense gratification. In the, in the modern world, any law that restricts people from sense gratification, people think that that is very bad. And therefore, the, the, the general understanding is that whatever you, you can do whatever you like as long as it doesn't grossly, overtly harm anyone. So everything's okay. You can kill animals because they're not people, according to misunderstanding. You can have sex with anything that moves or doesn't move as long as it's consensual and the uh, the object of your lust is not uh, underage. So, of course, if it's an animal, then I guess the age factor doesn't weigh in. But... The laws of Shastra are different to the laws of the demoniac state. The laws of the Shastra restrict us from sense gratification to purify us and to elevate us. In the demoniac society, people think they're elevated if they have more money and therefore more opportunity for sense gratification. But Krishna protects his devotees by giving the laws of Shastra, which protect us from sense gratification. In, in Vedic understanding, he's not the person who has most money and most opportunity for sense gratification, who is most glorious, but a person who voluntarily practices becoming detached from
from all these things. Mm. So Krishna himself is sadhu, he follows the law, he, sh- he comes to this world and shows us the example of how to follow the law, and by preaching Krishna consciousness, either directly or through others, he gets others to follow the law and also makes them into sadhus, makes them into shishta. Uh, so, Hare Krishna. Should I say one more? Okay, next name is Shuchihi, which means pure. This name uh, was already discussed 95 names earlier, but it should be discussed again. <laughs> Krishna is pure. Shuchi means pure. So, that should be understood. Krishna is not impure. Even There's nothing that Krishna can do to make himself impure. You say, well, then he's not good. Well, yes, in one sense, impure. He may pose as being impure in his Leela, just like after he killed Aghasura. Then Radha, she accused Krishna, now you've killed a bull, so you've become impure. And as a result, uh, Shamakund was constructed by Krishna and his friends, and then Radha Kund by Radha and her friends. So in one sense, yes, in Leela, Krishna may appear to be impure. But actually, he's always pure. And even activities that he performs that would be the cause of others becoming impure, Krishna does not become impure by them, but rather he demonstrates his purity by which he doesn't become impure. He doesn't become touched by the contaminations of material nature. So Krishna lies, Krishna steals, he takes away the clothes of the gopis, uh, he takes away the wives of the cowherd men, and in so many ways he appears to be not at all pure, but actually he's so pure that by remembering these pastimes, one also becomes pure. By chanting his names, one becomes pure. So, uh, even though, uh, yeah, we just had the, the names of, uh, Asankhya, uncountable, and Apramaya, Atma, this, this, the person who is not, uh, provable. So, even though Krishna has got Unlimited transcendental qualities. This, uh, this is a common term at the beginning of his commentary on Vishnu Sahasranama. Uh, Daladev Vidya Bhushan also refers to this. Uh, Ananta Kalyana Guna Vishishta, one who is decorated by all transcendental qualities which are beneficial for everyone. This particular term doesn't come, but a very similar term comes at the beginning of Baladev Vidya Bhushan's commentary, the very first line. So, uh, his purity is such, he's so pure, that even by remembering him, one becomes purified. What to speak of visiting his holy place or chanting his names. Srila Prabhupada sometimes commented that how can you say that Krishna is impure or immoral, when by chanting his names one becomes purified. So Krishna is all pure in every respect. Everything he does, everything he thinks, uh, his names are pure. Everything about him is pure. Just like everything about him is sweet. Everything about him is exalted. Everything about him is attractive. So... Uh, among the qualities that make him attractive is that he's always pure. Therefore, he's known as Shuchi, which means uh, the pure. 
and uncontaminated by any anything material in any sense whatsoever. He's, Krishna can never come under the uh, modes of material nature. He's always transcendental. Thump. Impure from our point of view, or from our understanding, means in contact with the modes of material nature. But Krishna is always aloof. He's always above that. So, simply by hearing of or remembering him, all the living beings become purified and the entire world becomes auspicious. So that is the task given to us by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to spread this Sankhya movement so that simply by hearing about Krishna people will become purified. Uh, that's, they'll become purified, they'll become happy. <clears throat> they'll become f- free from birth and death. They'll become blissful in love of Krishna. So, uh, that is possible, but Krishna is so pure, then uh, simply by hearing about him, remembering him, glorifying him, glorifying him, one also becomes pure. Uh, what is that verse? Srimanti Gayanti, Smaranti Nandanti, Srimanti Gayanti, Shrivanti Gayanti Abhikshnasha Shmaranti Nandanti Tavehi Tangjana Aha Taeva Pashantya Chirena Tava Kam Bhava Prabhaho Paramang Padam Bhujam Kunti Devi says to Krishna that those who hear about you or sing about you constantly and re- remember you or take pleasure in others doing so. Such persons, they will certainly see you very soon. And as a result, they will no longer have to see repeated birth and death. Krishna is so pure that we may try to become purified by our own endeavors, practicing yoga, or there's the sense of ritual purity, for those who are performing uh, this karma kanda activities, so they can become pure, purified of material reactions and go to the heavenly planets. That is one level of purification. But complete purification means to be Krishna conscious, to be fully Krishna conscious without any personal desire or without any personal attachment. And that comes how? Simply by remembering Krishna. Simply by chanting about Krishna. So discussing these names of Vishnu Sahasranam is also very purifying because the subject is Krishna. Only Krishna. So this is the best purification. Chanting his holy names. uh, Simply by... um, uh, Baladev Vidya Bhushan says that simply by hearing of or remembering him, all living entities become purified and the entire world becomes auspicious. So therefore, preaching of Krishna consciousness is also required. We often think of many different techniques how to preach, but the basic technique is to glorify Krishna. (laughs) Let others be purified by coming in contact with Krishna, by, by chanting his names, hearing his names, taking prasadam, hearing the philosophy spoken by Krishna and hearing descriptions of him. So, in this way, because Krishna is is so pure that if we come in contact with him, we become purified. If we think, well, I can't become purified, that's a kind of... If we think, "I'm I'm so very fallen, I can't become purified, that's a kind of egoism to think like that, in which we think that our own impurity is more powerful and more prominent than Krishna's purity. So I'm so I'm so impure that even Krishna can't purify me. But that, that's uh, 
it's a challenge to Krishna. It's like, like this idea of Satan. He becomes a the competitor to God and God's struggling with him and God just gets the upper hand, although it looks actually as if Satan has the upper hand and not God at all. So, uh, we should be confident that, that if we daily chant the holy names of Krishna, remember Krishna, uh, Krishna will purify us because he's so pure. It's just like if the sun comes in the sky, then there's light. We don't have to bring a candle. Of course, there may be clouds in the sky, but the effect of the light is still there. So, uh, Krishna is overwhelmingly pure. Therefore, we should remember him and chant his names. Tanama Rupicharitadi Sukirtananu Smrityo Kramena Rasanama Nasini Yoja Tishti Vrajet Tadanugami Jananu Ragi Kalam Nayad Ityakilam Upadesha Saram. The essence of all advice is that one should live in Vrindavan under the tutelage of a devotee who has developed or who has natural attraction for Krishna, and in that situation one should always uh, chant the names of Krishna and remember his forms and qualities and pastimes. This is the essence of all advice. So if we can't li- directly live in Vrindavan, the recommendation is that we can do so uh, mentally. So, Hare Krishna. Let us become purified by remembering Krishna. So, any thoughts, questions, comments about all this? Yes, please. Is the result different by chanting different names like Narayana and Krishna? Generally the name Narayana is chanted by persons who are attracted to Narayana, which means Krishna. But specifically Krishna as the Lord of all opulence. Whereas if we chant Krishna, Gopala, Govinda, Gokula, Nanda, these are names in, w- in which uh, the devotee cultivates more the mood of uh, serving Krishna in his Vrindavan pastimes. So, it's but uh, it's not that the residents of Vaikuntha or those who aspire for that don't chant the name Krishna. And it's not that the devotees of Krishna don't chant names, uh, which are generally more connected with his opulence. We find even in the tenth canto, in the description of Gopi Lila, there also the name Vishnu is there. Also in the description of, the, in many places, the, the, uh, in the, Damodar Ashtakam, Damodar is completely a Vrindavan Leela. There's the, that line is there. Namo Deva Damodar Ananta Vishnu. So the name comes also Vishnu. But generally, yeah, the, the names like Krishna, Gopal, Govinda, Shamasunda, Trivanga Sunda, all these names that, they're names which, uh, are chanted by devotees who are uh, attempting to worship Krishna in this mood, Chishte Vrajeta Danu Ragi Jananugami, following in the footsteps of devotees who are attached to Krishna in Vrindavan. Anything else? Anyone else? Yeah, please. Uh, 
uh, that, yeah, in the mode of goodness, at the end it's nectar. What is the end? Well, that's actually the English translation. Pariname mritopamam. It stated. Yatadegre vishamiva pariname mritopamam. That which seems like poison in the beginning, but nectar at the end. So that's a way of expressing it in English. But the Sanskrit says that that which in the beginning is like poison, but which becomes transformed into nectar, parinami mritopa. It, it doesn't actually say the end, like it's all over, finished. There's no, there's nowhere to go from here. It's just a way of expressing it in English. So, the end of the mode of goodness, well, there is no end. As long as you're in the modes of nature, then it just goes on and on and on. You can go from the mode of goodness down to the mode of ignorance. <laughs> or one can go up and up and up and go beyond the modes and go to Krishna. The mode of goodness is better because one can begin to think, see things clearly. Sattvam sanjayate jnanam from the mode of good, goodness develops knowledge. But complete knowledge means knowledge of Krishna. If to be, that also the mode of goodness that has the effect of thinking, of, of being materially happy and peaceful and, and then just being content with that and not going further. So the mode of goodness has its advantages and its disadvantages also. It's still within the modes of nature. So, yeah, the ultimate stage is prashanta, nishesha, manora, tantra. That's in Krishna consciousness one becomes completely peaceful. Uh, all one's material hankerings and attachments are all finished. And all the somersaults of the mind are also finished. Uh, yeah. yeah, I finished that. So. I was just thinking that often when when I read when uh, you start off with the devotees and the true devotees and the Christians, in one sense they don't get to be peaceful. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, devotees always appear to be the the pure devotees. They don't appear to be peaceful. Yeah. There was some idiot, PhD, so-called, who did, he did his thesis on Bhaktivinoda Thakur and he, he diagnosed him as having manic depression. <laughs> because he sometimes appeared to, from his songs he appears to be very happy and sometimes very sad. And actually if you see Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's, he sings like that, sometimes as if very sad. Amigoti Heen, I have no, uh, I have no hope, he sings. That, uh, Amar Jivan Shada Pape Rata Nahika Punnera Lesh, in my whole life, it's all full of sin without even a trace of any piety. So he sings like that. And other time, in other songs, he sings that, uh, very happily that, uh, what is that, uh, Tomar Shevai Shuva. Duk Hoi Jate Shei. Tomar Shevai Duk Hoi Jate Shei To Paramashuk. He says that. Well, there's the key. He says, in your service, all unhappiness is the greatest happiness. So yeah, the pure devotees are intensely emotional in Krishna's service. It's not a ritual or a formula or a duty, but, uh, Separation from Krishna or the, or the sense of being materially conditioned makes them feel very grief stricken. Whereas the uh, engagement in Krishna's service makes them uh, feel very happy. And just, there's one song in which he expresses that, which I just can't remember now. He says that, uh, 
since I've become surrendered to you, I'm feeling uh, I, I see everywhere happiness in all directions. So it seems that devotees are not very peaceful. I, from the material point of view, they may not be very peaceful, but their mind is very peaceful because they're fixed in Krishna. Uh, but at the same time, there is prem vivarta, the transformations of love, by which they, uh, they're, they're peaceful in the material sense because nashochati, nakangshati, they don't lament for whatever they may have had previously and they don't have now, or, and they don't hanker to get anything. They're, they're beyond all material lamentation and aspiration. But in pure devotional service, there is uh, transcendental anxiety, transcendental agitation of the mind. That's beyond Vaikuntha. In Vaikuntha, there's not much of that. Uh, there's simply peacefulness in Krishna's service. But beyond that, we find, for instance, Mother Yashoda is always full of anxiety. Krishna's gone outside, maybe again some demon will attack him. Just the very fact that she can't see him, that gives her anxiety. The gopis, they're, they're cursing, or, or not exactly cursing, but criticizing Lord Brahma. What a useless creator. He doesn't know what he's doing. He makes these eyes so that they blink, and then when we blink, we can't see Krishna. So, it is a state that is uh, materially completely peaceful because one is beyond all material anxiety, but in a state of spiritual anxiety, which is uh, the highest happiness. So, yeah, when we speak of peacefulness, that that means in relationship to this material condition of of mental somersaults and desiring and uh, lamenting, but spiritual bliss is also full of uh, anxiety and sometimes anger and turbulence, but that's all in relationship to Krishna. So that's the highest bliss. If, if you don't, if you want complete peacefulness, then the best place is Vaikuntha. <laughs> Or maybe the impersonal Brahman. They're very peaceful there. <laughs> What's the use? Peace is not the ultimate goal of a devotee. His goal is service to Krishna. Prem. Prem prayojan. Prema pumarto mahan. Chaitanya Mahabharata instructed that the highest aspiration of a devotee is to attain pure love of Krishna. Ah, yeah, that, that's that. Shuddha Bhakata Charana Renu. Bhajana Anukula. That, so that's, he's describing all that which is, uh, he says in there, what is that, uh, there are many in there, he says that, uh, Jugala Murti Dekiya Moa Parama Ananda Hoy. When I see the forms of Radha Govinda, then I experience the highest happiness. But there's one song in particular, when he, he's expressed, it's just an expression of his happiness in s- surrender to Krishna, uh, which I can't remember now. Tomacharan. I can't remember. I don't think you know it, any of you. That's a very, in which he's expressing his great happiness. I know it, but, uh, just not, just not remembering it. So, Hare Krishna. Everyone should be in anxiety. How to serve Krishna better? Then we'll lose all our material anxiety. Hare Krishna.